Hello, um, and thank you everybody for um, for being here. And I'm really glad to to have been invited. And uh, thank you so much for that that introduction. Um, I want to begin this talk uh, with a quote. Um, so, in Rockford, Illinois, in 1914, a large billboard sprung up out of nowhere, and it was a piece of political performance art. And the title said, everybody works but the vacant lot. And underneath, the artist had put, I pay $3,600 for this lot and will hold till I get 6,000. The profit is unearned increment made possible by the presence of this community and the enterprise of its people. I take the profit without earning it. For the remedy, read Henry George. And it was signed off by the artist Faye Lewis. Um, I'll, I'll come back to Henry George and his remedy a bit later on, but I wanted to start with this because I wanted to make the point that this is actually a very old problem. Housing issues, uh, overcrowding, um, you know, illnesses and bad, sorry, poor health and um, slum landlords and overcharging, uh, you know, rack rents and things like that. These are all very long standing problems that have been documented throughout the centuries. And it's something that um, is only, I think, the, that's being missed a bit in the narrative nowadays because we have, um, we had in the last uh, century a bit of a blip, and that was the post war. Um, housing kind of policy revolution and in a general sort of post-war referred to as the golden age where um, the welfare state was created and many progressive policies were put in place and that kind of formed the backdrop for our expectations of what housing justice actually looks like um, and because housing uh, affordability has worsened so much in the last 40 years or so um, particularly in the last 20 uh, it's very easy to say, well, what's gone wrong now and look to the sort of the short term and what changed. And and I think rather than seeing it that way, we see what, it's more of a reversion to to the mean. And we need to look at really fundamental problems if we're going to solve this. If we're not just going to have another blip and solve it for one generation or two, and if we're going to just solve it permanently, I think this is what we need to be looking at, which is why I'm actually so heartened today to see such a big focus on what I think is the primary issue, which is land and land speculation, land affordability. How do we get access to land for building more houses without the price of that land necessitating such high house prices that the problem just perpetuates? So I'm going to start by, um, excuse me. I'd like to start by talking a bit about the, the planning system and how it got broken, basically. Um, so that my book is, um, uh, it's just <laughs> carefully st stashed in the background, but it does cover the, the whole of the UK. So I'm going to just talk in broad brush strokes about um, the UK policy, um, but it, with it in mind that many of these issues are very highly specific to Wales as well. So um, the Town and Country Planning Act was introduced in 1947 to rebuild a country that had been ravaged by war. Um, there were soldiers squatting in um, in empty buildings, and it you know, there was a public outcry. It was it was something that everybody was in the same boat. There wasn't this intergenerational divide that we have now. It was very much uh, everybody acknowledges that we have a massive housing emergency, and the government at the time, um, the the wonderful and Iron Bevan, he. It, he was actually the Minister for Health and Housing, which I find quite pertinent for today because it's such a natural combination of, you know, that housing is so intertwined with our mental and physical health that um, perhaps in the in the aftermath of, of the in the ongoing global pandemic that we're witnessing, um, it's something that we should reconsider that to merge the two. Um, but that's a bit of a diversion. But he, he said, his vision for housing was that the working man, the doctor and the clergyman would live in close proximity to each other. So this this was the baseline for the, the social housing um, revolution, if you want to call it that, in those post-war years. It wasn't, nowadays, social housing is seen as 
something that you go if it's you know it's an absolute last resort it's you only go if you're absolutely desperate and have nowhere else to turn um but that was not its original vision and actually uh, the original social homes that were built were of high quality they were spacious they had gardens they were they were family homes and they didn't have any of the far from the social stigma that's potentially you know unfortunately attached to social housing today they were desirable um and so in that time with the advent of the planning system we managed to build uh, between 1939 and 1953 1.3 million council homes were built and then by 1961 a further 1 million uh, had been added to the to the stock and this coincided with a peak in private house building um quite often the argument against state provision of um of good services is that it will crowd out private investment and that you know we'll lose the benefits of having a free market because the government has sort of taken over but this isn't what happened and in 1968 private house building peaked 226,000 homes per year um and we achieved 185,000 social homes in the same year a record that has not since been touched um so interestingly during those those years between 1939 and 1979 home ownership also increased so it went from 33% of the population to over half 55% of the population now the reason i find this interesting is because often what happened afterwards right to buy and the deregulation of the private rented sector and and those kinds of um pro market policies were there generally credited with expanding access to home ownership. But between uh, the, the advent of right to buy and today, home ownership has gone up from 55% to 63%. So it hasn't had the same um, effect at realizing the so-called home ownership dream as, as a big um, expansion of social housing actually had. Um, but obviously we can see a problem because what happened? Why was this huge feat of building possible in the early years of the of the go of the post war age, but it wasn't then sustainable over the long term? And the reason for this is the act, as we know today, we have this kind of two tier land market. So we have um, land that is just agricultural or um you know it doesn't have permission to build anything residential on it or it's commercial use and then we have residential planning permission granted land and um those that two-tier effect the, the price differential between land without planning permission and land with is astronomical um now this was foreseen when the 1947 act was created um, it was never meant to create this weird two-tier effect. Um, so they, they brought in a law called the Betterment Tax. So that meant 100% of the planning gain that occurred on the grants of planning permission was payable to the central land board. Um, the only way builders could profit uh, was by building things. So this helps to explain why building was such a um, an easy and efficient, fast process um, at, at that time. And in addition to that, there were, the, there were compulsory purchase laws that enabled the authorities to acquire land at its current use value, not its speculative future value, with, which includes the imaginary houses that haven't been built yet. So because of this land acquisition, land acquisition for affordable housing, social housing was much uh, cheaper, much easier. Um, but obviously there was a group who were massively disadvantaged by this law and that was the, the landowners. And um, the landowners launched a very successful lobbying campaign. They were all over the newspapers. They were complaining that um, the, the law breached their human rights to profit from from all this land. So um, the betterment tax did not last long. It was scrapped not very long after it was brought in. Um, but then this still had an effect that, that was pro building because what you had was um, builders who could sell their land 
to a private developer and keep the planning gain um, if they got planning permission. But if they were subject to compulsory purchase, they would still be compensated at current use value. And this created a huge disparity. And, and if anything, so there was a carrot, which you know you can sell to a private developer and, and develop that land. But there was also a stick, which was if you sit on that land and hold out and hope that it's just gonna rise in value whilst you rake in the gains without doing anything, you could just get it subject to compulsory purchase. Um, now the landowners didn't like this aspect of the law either. And again, after further lobbying, um, the, the Planning Act was amended in 1959. And there was also the Land Compensation Act in 1961, which basically meant that not only would landowners be compensated the full market value of, of their land um, based on what was going to be built on it, they'd be, they'd be compensated according to almost like the best case scenario. So the hope value of the land, which is what the land might have become had it not been subject to compulsory purchase. So they were really getting compensated for things that were imaginary, but that was what they argued they, what they were entitled to according to their human rights. Mm. So um, the, the impact of this can be seen in, um, in the 12 years between 1963 and 1975, land acquisition costs for the average council home went from less than 4,000 pounds to almost 18,000 uh, pounds adjusted for 2016 money. So it just became, that cost then became baked into the, the funding and the, the ability of the authorities to be able to produce um, social housing on, on the same scale. And similarly, um, you know, the private sector, every, everything slowed down. As, you, as I've alluded to earlier, um, that era just marked a downward trend in house building that we have seen ever since. And this, the planning system in its current form is sort of this, this broken accident that is not in the spirit at all of the original law. Uh, so that's that's one component, that's one element of how this housing crisis came to be, how the affordable supply shortage came to be so acute. Uh, the second component is uh, what we saw happening in the financial reforms of the 1980s. So prior to 1980, um, most mortgage lending was done by building societies. And there was a particular mechanism within the way that building societies operated that ensured that um, mortgages were rationed to a degree. There wasn't just this insane flurry of, um, of mortgage sort of credit, you know, lenders uh, granting loans left, right and centre. There was a built in sort of um, speed limit in the fact that um, the mortgages had to be funded by savers deposits. And if you found yourself, um, you know, trying to get a mortgage from a building society that did not have the funds, you would find yourself in a mortgage queue. And this helped to just slow down the frenzy of activity in the housing market. There wasn't quite the same um, acute boom and bust um, pattern that we see today. Um, but there were some big, wide reaching financial reforms in the 1980s. And what happened was big banks were suddenly allowed to enter the mortgage market. They were no longer required to use uh, domestic deposits to fund, fund these mortgages. And they broke into the residential mortgage market for the first time. I was surprised when I learned this. I thought banks had always given mortgages out since just it was some key thing. I mean, it's the key, um, it's a key area of business in retail banking nowadays. Um, you know, the majority of funds that are lent by by banks on the high street are actually um, lent as a collateral for, for housing. So um, the fact that that wasn't actually what banks even used to do is is quite a massive change in how, in how our sort of financial landscape looks. So, um, the link between savers deposits and the availability of mortgage credit was broken. Mortgages could now be offered on demand. The only limiting factor would be the credit worthiness of the borrower and the value of the collateral. Um, but the problem with the collateral, so the house that the mortgage is secured against, that is a moving target that's stuck in a feedback loop because if you take out increasing amounts if you know as as money is created it doesn't come from anywhere um 
sorry, I'll back up a bit because this is actually an important point. Um, the fact, I think a lot of people do think that credit comes from central banks multiplying up their reserves or it comes from, as I just described earlier, building societies, um, lending out savers deposits. But modern, uh, modern banking, modern lending is simply the money is created at the point of making the loan. So the money just appears and it can be created very quickly, far more quickly, actually, than a house can be built. Um, so this inevitably is is uh, going to lead to log jams in and, and, and inflationary bubbles in the market because as housing demand goes up and mortgages are are created um, to respond to uh, you know as as more demand there's this more demand for housing more and more mortgage credit is created you can't take out a mortgage against a home that hasn't been built yet so the number of homes is staying the same. But the amount of credits chasing after these homes is expanding and if you give more people more and more money to, to bid for the same thing what's going to happen that the price is simply going to shoot up and that is precisely what we have seen and it enters into this very destructive boom and bust cycle because eventually house prices become so divorced from reality and so divorced from what people actually earn that even with extremely low deposits and lower interest rates, people are unable to make the monthly repayments. So there's there's a frenzy of activity. Everybody goes nuts. House prices go up. Then it, the the whole house of cards comes crashing down, and that's where we get this cycle. Um, and on top of that, uh, in in 1997, we saw the introduction of the buy to let mortgage. Um, and what this has done is effectively um, it's stripped back a lot of tenants rights. Uh, well, a lot of tenants rights were had to be stripped in order for banks to feel secure in lending against rental properties. And um, and that's why we saw the advent of, of Section 21 and it became the default tenancy in, in 1996. Uh, it was so that banks could repossess without the fear of becoming a landlord. So housing insecurity was actually necessary to kind of create this investment boom in housing. And one thing that I did actually find in my research was that it's not just the case that investor demand for housing, buy to let landlord demand for housing responds to this spontaneous spike in tenant demand. What's actually happening is that buy to let investors can borrow on more favorable terms uh, or have e relatively easier access to finance than first time buyers, uh, buy to let landlords. Although they have to have dig bigger deposits, they were able to fund their buy to let purchases through taking equity out of their homes that they owned, which was far more easy to acquire housing equity than it is to painstakingly save up for a deposit as members of Generation Rent will know. Um, and landlords could also take out loans on an interest only basis which is now not available to first time buyers. So what we actually have now is that landlords have cheaper access to the same housing and tenants are paying more for the same housing. Um, so there's a, there's a complete um, competitive advantage that investors have that then actively keeps people trapped in generation rent. And I think, you know, in the late eighties, 10% of the population were renting that has gone up to that has doubled since and is, is still rising. So um, what's the current state of play? Um, so we have, I'll come back to land now because that is that is where the, the crux of this matter really lies. It seems to, it seems absurd to say that we have a land shortage um, across the UK because about 6% of, of UK land mass is actually built on. But what we do have is a shortage of people who are willing to sell their land to part with it. Um, Mark Twain supposedly once said, buy land, they aren't making it anymore. Um, it's So due to, due to ultra low interest rates and the huge windfall gains that are possible if you are a landowner with some agricultural land, there isn't really any penalty to just sitting on land and you don't have to part with that land until you get a price that, that kind of sounds like it suits you. Um, I'm, nine in 10 planning applications are currently approved. Um, so 
it's although the gains are within the realms of, of a lottery win um the actual uh odds are far more in your favor so um you know and a, a key problem that you might think is how do we then convince landowners to sell how, why would they ever sell or if uh, why would anyone actually buy you know why would anyone buy an agricultural piece of land not knowing whether or not they're going to get planning permission on it because if you shell out a million pounds for a piece of land um and then you are repeatedly denied permission to even build on it that's a pretty expensive risk to take and this is where a whole side industry has sprung up that is relatively out of view and underreported on but it's called the land promotion industry and land promoters help landowners get planning permission in exchange for a cut of the proceeds and they use legal contracts called option and promotion agreements um now when i was researching the book um i think facebook decided that i must be some kind of budding um property uh, you know developer or something and so my newsfeed was flooded with all of these sort of snake oil salesmen trying to tell me how to get rich quick from property uh, but one of them caught my eye and it was a land promoter who was training other people in how to make money out of land and his his sort of selling point was that he he used to be a builder he used to think that property development was all about building things it was all about being productive and you know set actually selling the, the homes that you've constructed and he'd been disillusioned with that because he had realized that builders actually shoulder the majority of the risk in the development process and yet they take in the smallest gains their margins are not that um are not that um strong you know so they're they're taking the biggest risk they're getting the lowest rewards and their their pipelines as well have to be maintained because you have to have a constant stream of sales and a, a land bank sort of backs up in order to make sure that you can have that steady output that then funds the new land acquisitions and and, and the whole process. So it, it's a very risky business. Um, and as we've seen with the major house builders, it can be extremely profitable and earn its bosses um, multi-million pound bonuses, but it's also at risk of... Um, of total ruin if you if it's mistimed or you know if you can't sell at the price that you've acquired the land for so large house builders uh, this this was something that um the let win review uh, in 2018 identified was that large house builders who do actually dominate uh the market they're the main sort of engines of uk housing output they um end up drip feeding they end up rationing their housing output because they have paid so much to acquire the land that then they cannot afford for house prices in that area to fall to a more affordable level they need house prices to stay high in order to recoup the extortionate amount that they've had to fork out just to acquire some land to build on so yes you will find many many criticisms of the development industry uh in my book and many abuses and shod examples of shoddy workmanship we've had two major scandals the leasehold scandal and the cladding scandal and all manner of, of genuinely awful behavior but i think on housing output i will give house builders a a bit of a pass because i don't think it's their fault i think um the fact that they are kind of held to ransom by this the way that the the land market actually works is is what's causing the problem so um building remains as slow as it ever was um so we're and house builders have an incentive to move slowly to keep house prices as high as possible and the government is continuing to pump even more mortgage credit into the um into the market uh, just recently we've had the announcement that taxpayer payer funds will help to under underwrite 95 percent mortgages for first-time buyers um so more credit creation still no more house building it's inevitable that uh, i mean we have seen outrageous house price inflation given the context of we're in a global pandemic and everybody was predicting a major crash um and the opposite has actually happened and if the government is going to continue to sort of prop the market up with 
um, with its guarantees and its inflationary policies, then there's no real reason to think that that's going to result in a crash anytime soon. So what we have is quite a big mess <laughs> uh, and quite a, a destructive feedback loop that isn't being intercepted. Um, and I know policies differ between England and Wales, and I think the situation is, is worse in England. I think they've got it, you know, they're behind on certain measures, abolishing right to buy being one of them. Um, there, there are others. Um, but in t fundamentally, the solution is we need to have a situation where building is the most profitable way to use a piece of land or unless you're a farmer obviously you're actually going to use the, the land for agriculture but if, if you if somebody has a, a piece of potentially developable land then the buy and hold strategy where you just hold out for the highest price you can possibly get and there's no penalty to just sitting on it um that strategy would have to lead to just a loss it would have to be loss making like it was in those post-war years if you sat on around on land there was no benefit to it and you could just be subject to compulsory purchase so there was a real fire under people to to get building um and land speculation is at the heart of it and i think this is where we need to direct our policy uh, campaigning and our research efforts to just raise awareness of this issue because it isn't really very widely known and i'll come back to um who I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the 19th century economist called Henry George, um, who observed a problem in the 19th century called the progress and poverty paradox. He wrote a book of the same name, which was popular all over the globe. Um, but he observed the phenomenon of whenever there's um, a, an economic boom, a huge sort of flourishing of economic activity, the spoils of these of these gains don't flow to everybody equally. Um, they flow disproportionately to the people who own land and property. And so rising wages, if you don't own your own home, um, rising wages simply get offset by rising rents. And we are no better off um, in real terms. Um, and the reason he called it progress and poverty was that he actually lived um, in, you know, on the East Coast and he went over to to the west coast um sorry the other way around <laughs> he lived on the west coast and he went over to the east coast and uh he observed that um in um you know although it was much wealthier and there was much more kind of um you know prosperity all around there were levels of poverty that he had never witnessed when he was back home so it's, it's not so much that when an area becomes wealthy it's uh, you know, some people become extremely wealthy and leave everybody else behind and everybody else is poor just by comparison. It sort of shunts people in both directions. So prosperity generates a corresponding additional poverty. And he put this all down to this problem of land being the thing that soaks up all the wealth, it soaks up all the gains. And the solution that he proposed was a, a single tax, a land value tax. And you may hear that mentioned today um, with other people, other presenters, um, but the idea is that everybody would pay um, what that that level of gain that they haven't created. You know, just the um, the economic gains that just that flow to land through, as we saw at the beginning. You know, with Fay Lewis, the get the increment I earn is to, to do with the um, this community and the enterprise of its people, um, and that is shared around. So everybody wins. It it's, it's, it's a policy to ensure that a rising tide really does lift all boats. And it also intercepts this very chaotic boom and bust cycle where house prices are chased up and up and up and up. And then they hit reality and they come crashing down and it uh, causes recession. And it's, it's very destabilizing and destructive for everybody. So that was his solution. But um, I'm not overly wedded to one particular solution. And I think we should really focus on on policies just broadly tackling land speculation because given how much of the nation's wealth is stored in property just in people's main residences people tend to be very resistant to to land value taxes so i think um 
you know, it could also be achieved through things like security of tenure for tenants and rent controls. These things reduce the speculative appeal of housing because you can't make as much money out of it. We can look at planning, genuinely uh, democratic and progressive planning reform. We can look at expanding the social housing stock. Um, because again, if you've got a much more a robust option for uh, tenants on lower incomes, then you've kind of kicked rogue landlords out of the market and private landlords have to up their game because they they, they have a, a new competitor. And again, so the speculative appeal of investing in housing goes down. So I won't say too much more on that because I'm sure many of the other speakers today, I think we've got, um, we've got Community Land Scotland and Bangor University and uh, Professor from Bangor University, Housing Justice Cymru, George Monbiot and Beth Stratford. It all looks to be quite a lot of people are going to be discussing this issue of land and they might drill down into kind of the more, um, the, the finer details. Um, but one thing I'll say before I go is um, I think I, I wouldn't want us to approach this as a kind of an us versus them issue because I think this whole addiction that we have to house price inflation is deeply ingrained into our culture and I remember a few years ago uh, well when I was researching the book and I, this was a former colleague I've kind of lost touch now but we were chatting and I was telling her about this this man that I'd interviewed who was doing a community-led housing scheme and he was turning shipping container homes into um uh low cost housing that anybody could buy and it was just a, a way of escaping the the, sh the chokehold of the private rented sector so you could get into some affordable housing keep more of what you earn and not have to be subject to um you know not essentially funding your landlord's pension um whilst you don't have one of your own um so she she took all of this in and she said um oh that's great you know you you could even take advantage of that no you could do that you could because you could move into one of these things and then save up for a real house and then you could keep the shipping container and rent it out and <laughs> I could have just put my head through the wall because it was so undermining the point but I'm kind of glad that she said that because I think it does it does reveal the just the automatic nature that we have of, of viewing property as as a vehicle for wealth accumulation and I would just ask all of us to to dig deep and kind of if you're a homeowner, just to, to question, you know, that if you we've all, you know, if you go on Zoopla or Right Move and you see that your house has gone up in value and there's a little kind of frisson of, oh, that's nice. Or, you know, maybe you think your pension is looking a bit sad. Um, I can relate to on that. Um, but if, you know, you might think, well, it's fine. What I'll do is my house will go up in value and then I can downsize when I'm at retirement age and it'll, um, you know, that'll fund my pension. And I think, I'm not saying don't do those things. All I'm saying is let's just challenge that impulse to see property inflation, price inflation as a good thing. And I, I wanted to work towards the day where we can see the headline, property prices remain flat for 10th year running and it's a it's cause for celebration and not despair. So I realize I've <laughs> that's the end of the, what I have prepared and I realize I've left basically no time for for questions um but i am actually um in the breakout session um with john pusey coming up um so if you do want if you do have questions or also um i'm just going to type my email address in the q a box you can um email me um with any questions that you have i'd be happy to answer um and one final thing is that I just want to add this. If you were wanting to grab a copy of my book, I have got a special discount code for delegates of this uh, of this talk, uh, which I'm pasting into the box now. But if you miss it again, feel free to email me and I will uh, get a copy of that over to you. Sorry for going over there. I thought I wasn't going to take long enough. But <laughs> No worries, Chloe. That was, that was fascinating in terms of... I've worked in housing all of my life and found just some things in there just really interesting of understanding the history of how we've got to the position that we're in. And noting your words really at the end of needing to break the cycle and we all have a responsibility if we're going to change the way that the housing market and the housing system works. Um, we, we've got perhaps 30 seconds and I appreciate you said it's not just one thing, 
um, that that needs to solve. But it felt that there was quite a lot of the problem starting with planning, and perhaps that's where the solutions might be to start with around a more fundamental look at planning. W would that be something you'd agree with, or you think we we if we're going to start anywhere, where would you start? I would absolutely start with planning, um, but I wouldn't approach it in the way that the um, the English government is currently approaching it with its planning white paper. Because as I mentioned earlier about carrots and sticks, my view of the current planning white paper is that it's all carrots and no stick. And I think it's just taking too much of the um, of the of the controls away without encouraging people to stop sitting on land and to build and to actually uh, you know stop these speculative transactions and stop trading land and build on it um so i would start there but i would do it differently to how it's being proposed yeah yeah i think lots of us would agree with that chloe thank you very much um chloe mentioned that um she's also in a, running a breakout session so if you want to hear more and um ask some questions then please go to that breakout session <laughs>